Riders of the Three-Toed Horse, a radio play by Garrett Vance and Burke Duncan, based on the novelette by Garrett Vance, published in the magazine Jim Bain's Universe. Elias Ulstrom pulled over his pickup truck and stared at the sign printed in old-time rodeo-style lettering. Welcome to Agate County. Hmm. How could I miss it three times? It had already been a long drive over the Snoqualmie Pass to Washington State's dry center. The road climbed through a corridor of rock columns to the top of Agate County's massive volcanic mesa. Elias resisted the urge to study amazingly straight pillars. They looked man-made as if chiseled by the hands of unknown prehistoric artisans. Leaving the canyon, the view opened onto the expanse of the Awatamampa Massif. The heat began to rise, so Elias opened all the windows. A warm breeze blew pleasantly through the interior. Elias reviewed an agenda in his mind. I've got to report directly to the game warden, then I'll settle into my cabin. That's going to be my home while I'm out here. At last, he reached the cliffs of the Incense River Gorge. Elias marveled at the immense scale of the realm. The river below was wide and sluggish. He saw the tan steel bridge over the startling blue of the river. An area of green parkland grew in defiance of hostile surroundings. The trip down into the gorge was a gauntlet of hairpin curves and dizzying chasms. The battered guardrail did not inspire confidence. Arriving safely at the bottom, Elias pulled into the neat public rest area, near the bridge. Dusty, late-model sedans and pickup trucks were clustered at the far end of the parking lot. A man in a white cowboy hat, black t-shirt, and blue jeans waved at him from the narrow shade of a poplar. Hello. Are you the geology professor? Sure am. Elias Olstrom. Buck Lopez. Nice to meet you. Buck's wide brown face held an expression of quiet amusement. Two braids of lustrous black hair, ending in turquoise clips, flanked his broad chest. Welcome to Agate County. Our Awatamapam tribal elders are going to do a ceremony for you, then I'll ride with you to the river station. Come on this way. That's great. I've never been the subject of a welcoming ceremony before. It's not actually a welcoming ceremony. You don't need to do anything, just... Stay quiet and be polite to the elders. Do you mean those guys? They all wore blue jeans and wool shirts of various plaids, but from the chest up they resembled a gathering of chimeras. Carved and painted masks covered their heads and shoulders. Huge red eyes and leering fang-filled grins, narrow green eyes and pointed yellow tusks. Some had long curling noses painted blue, while others had no noses at all. Each one was decorated with carved bone, stone, and feathers. No two were alike, but all had an equally terrifying effect. They slowly shuffled apart to form a loose circle around Elias. During the ceremony, try to keep your mind empty and spirit quiet. Don't speak until it's over. I'll stand over there by that flat rock. Elias nodded. His mouth had become too dry to answer anyway. Elias gazed nervously as the elders began to move around him. After several slow revolutions, Elias tried not to ask himself how long it would take. The circle grew tighter around him with each turn. Elias felt dizzy. Someone lit a smoky fire. The dancers grew in numbers. Where did those other dancers come from? How did I not notice their arrival? Those four men don't have shirts, pants, or shoes. Just leather skirts and those masks. <coughs> Elias became distracted by the reeking haze of smoking smudge sticks now carried by each dancer. The elders waved them toward Elias, enveloping him in smoke that smelled like sagebrush. He struggled not to pass out from the desert heat, reeking pall of smoke and hypnotic dizziness of the dancers' shuffling steps. The dancers nearly touched him now, Leering masks swayed and shook. Elias' head throbbed. He struggled to stay on his feet, but was about to slip into blackness. (laughs) 
The ceremony is over. What? The ceremony is over. It, it would be good of you to thank the elders, Elias. <sighs> thank you, elders. The elders tilted their masked heads slightly, turned and walked away. You okay, man? I think so. Elias thought to himself. Actually, I want to throw up. My clothes are soaking wet with sweat and I smell like a smudge stick. We have to wait here a few minutes until the elders take off their masks and drive away. We shouldn't see their faces after a mass ceremony. They need time to become their everyday selves again. That's fine. I'm not sure I can walk just yet anyway. Say, Buck, where are those elders going on foot? They're the ones who joined the dance later. Back where they came from. I can't tell where that is. They just passed out of sight behind that rocky hillock. The elders have all gone. Come on. I've got some cold pops and a cooler. Thanks for the soda. <laughs> That's all right. From what I understand, you're not just a geologist. Right. I have doctorates in geology and paleontology. Really? That's impressive. What what makes you want to leave the university to rough it out here? I was sick and tired of university life. And what little field work I've done just left me wanting more. This Agate County Geology Project was my way out of another year of teaching introductory freshman courses. If I make a name for myself here, I'll never have to face students or petty office politics again. <laughs> I just had to get away. I know what you mean. Come on. We'd better get going. I like your pickup. What year is it? It's a 63 Chevy. Well, that's practically a classic. Turn right onto this gravel road. It's nice to drive by the river. Yeah, yeah. We don't have much further to the river station. Is this reservation land? Reservation? Ha! We don't have a reservation. This is a Watamapam land. I couldn't find much history of your people at the library. Didn't the government try to take your land? They could never find it. So they gave up. The county takes care of things. Washington State and the feds leave us alone. Hey, stop here. I've got to open up that steel gate. I'll ride back here on the tailgate. We're almost there, just a hundred yards ahead. This ranch house is the river station where I live. The trailer over there belongs to Pete. He's my assistant game warden, among other things. Oh, is he here now? I'd like to meet him. Pete's up in Merkaba today, seeing his girlfriend. You'll meet him later. Okay. Here, let's throw those boxes in your truck. This is the gear for your first survey and the county's instructions and maps. Pretty simple stuff for a professor. There's a radio up there. If you need anything, there's usually someone listening. You can get a signal from the cabin, but any further up in the canyons, and it won't work. Thanks, Buck. Say, if that wasn't a welcoming ceremony, then what was it? It was a ceremony of protection. They used the smoke to wash the city stink off you and make you smell like you belong out here. Now the ancestor spirits won't hassle you.
<laughs> well, okay then. It's a good thing to know I'm safe from the spirits. I'd better get going. Thanks again for everything. You're only safe from our spirits. Listen up, man. This isn't a coffee shop on campus. There are dangers in Agat County. If you stick near the trails and follow the county instructions, then you should be fine. But if you start playing explorer in those back canyons, you're asking for trouble. Stay on the map, man. Listen to your instincts. If something doesn't seem right, then get away from it. Okay? Okay. I'll remember that. Good. <laughs> now, it's going to be dark soon. You've still got four miles to go. Just follow the road to its end, and you'll be there. Good luck, Elias. Sorry to get heavy, but it's for your own good. I, I just want you to be safe. Thanks, Buck. I'll be careful out there. I've had some field training in rough country over in the Olympic Mountains. I know it's a Watamapam land, and I will always respect your ways. I know. Come back when you run out of beer up there, and we'll go to town. I stuck a case in the fridge for you when I was prepping it. Compliments of County Fish and Game. Take care, man. You too. I'll see you later. Elias watched the river station growing smaller in his rearview mirror as he followed another bumpy sand road into the side canyon that stretched south, away from the river. It was late afternoon now. A veneer of bronze was cast over the landscape. Elias mulled over the day in his mind. This has been one of the oddest days I've ever had. Does Agate County exist in a world of its own? Well, maybe not. There's a power line following the road. I won't be stuck using gas lanterns in a wood stove. The narrow canyon opened into a broader valley, and he saw his new home perched a hundred feet above the flat bottom of the northern wall. The road climbed at a gentle pitch up the cliffside, passed through a natural arch, and stopped behind a small brown cabin made of the area's volcanic stones. The cabin's interior was simple, with rustic furnishings and dated features. He opened the chilly 1950s fridge and found the case of beers. Oh good, a back door. I can cross ventilate if it stays hot tonight. Soon Elias grew sleepy. He went to bed with the sunset. We now return to Riders of the Three-Toed Horse. Elias was up before dawn. By first light, he had driven three miles up the sandy, tumbleweed-strewn flats to the first of the canyons on his list of mineral surveys. He was to go no more than one mile up each of the seven marked on the map. Elias donned his backpack and walked through the narrow corridor. Canyon walls towered a good 400 feet over his head. The narrow passage opened into a square valley from which three other smaller canyons branched off. A circular formation of 80-foot-tall rocks rose from a mound in the center, Elias thought. Those must be what the map calls Fortress Rocks. I can see why. They look just like medieval towers. After climbing the gravel slope at their bases, Elias entered a courtyard. He arranged his gear on a flat basalt boulder. Elias put a compass in his pocket, then stuck a hammer and chisel on his belt and trudged on. The county had an interest in certain minerals. 
That was odd, since none of them had any economic value. Elias was happy to comply. With minerals came fossils. He spent a lot of time chiseling out samples from various strata, sometimes clambering farther up the tower's bases to reach a likely deposit. Elias thought, Jeez. I've never liked climbing much. A fall out here could be fatal. I'd better find a safer elevation. On his careful path down, something made him stop and stare at the rock wall. He pushed aside a tenacious prickly weed that blocked his view. Petroglyphs! The petroglyphs portrayed three riders. Each stylized carving was about a foot tall and contained great detail, despite the difficult medium. The riders had short torsos and legs, but their arms and heads were long. Their features were monstrous. Large round eyes and wide mouths with rows of small sharp teeth. They carried spears with trident tips. Their mounts were also unusually shaped with short legs, broad torsos, and short heads. Unlike horses' hooves, their feet had three toes, Elias thought. Three toes? That reminds me of those extinct proto-horses like Merrick Hippus from the Eocene Epoch. That's impossible. Maybe the artist found a fossil. I can't believe it. I've discovered something this remarkable on my first morning out here. I'll have to ask Buck if anyone has ever documented this before. Elias resisted dancing a jig. He sat down in the shade with his back against the outer wall of one megalith. He unfolded a map across his knees. It bore the legend Agate County, West Canyons, Bowsher and Flint, 1921. The mapping stopped near the edges and the makers had left question marks. The empty western edge of the map was just beyond the cliff across from him. The cliff's top edge must have been a hundred feet high at its lowest dip, Elias thought. It might be useful to get a bird's eye view of the area, to get a sense of the scale I'm dealing with. Maybe I can see the Columbia River about 40 miles from here. The cliff had a cleft in it, a sloping jumble of uneven rocks among smooth basalt pillars. It was reachable from a steep sand dune that had formed against the wall. The top end of the chute was well back from the rim, Elias thought. The route looks steep, but doable. I've got climbing gear if it gets hairy, especially on the way down. Gaining the dome's top was slow going in the sliding sand, but he eventually stood studying the intended climb. It was almost a staircase with loose scree in places, but reasonably safe. He started climbing. With only two tough spots where he had trouble finding a solid grip, he made it to the top. Next, he circled around a large basalt formation which blocked the view west. He stopped and stared at the vista. What the? I never expected this. Elias saw hundreds more canyons stretching off into the distance, like mud dried and cracked after rain. They spread west all the way to the horizon. Well, this can't be right. Where's the Columbia River? Where are the Cascade Mountains? I must be disoriented. I'd better check my compass. The needle sure quivers out here. There must be some magnetic anomalies. Let's see. It's after two o'clock, and the sun is dipping in that direction. So I'm definitely facing west. And in that west, a maze of canyons that shouldn't be there, stretched into infinity. There must be an explanation. A mirage? There's another mesa a mile from here. Maybe I just need a different perspective. He walked through gnarled, gray-barked sagebrush. Elias looked out across the next canyon, which was a hundred feet wide and as deep as the one he had just left. The bottom was sandy and contained a well-worn trail. The canyon bent away in a gentle bow in both directions. He walked westward along its lip. Wait a minute. I've traveled off the map. Buck told me not to. <laughs> no, wait. That was just tribal superstition. He felt a presence nearby that made him want to leave quickly. He was about to turn back when the corner of his eye caught movement. 
A brush-covered embankment obscured its source. Elias peered through a curtain of sagebrush across the canyon. The view startled him. On a wide shelf, beneath a shadowy overhang, a group of children played. All were about four feet tall, bronze-skinned, and naked except for loincloths and gold ornaments that glittered in the afternoon sun. Eight of them stood in a circle, kicking a white ball back and forth. Something stirred behind them. A group of animals rested in the shade of an overhanging cliff. Elias thought to himself, What are those animals behind the kids? Are they large dogs? Deer? It's hard to tell at this distance. Oh, I get it. I must have stumbled upon a remote Awatomopam village. No wonder Buck told me to stay on the map. The tribe obviously wants to keep outsiders away from this place. Well, when you consider how they maintain their culture, it's no surprise that I'd find a hidden village with children frolicking in traditional dress. This must be the presence that spooked me. Well, now I feel a little guilty for spying on them. I'll leave quietly, and they'll never know. How come I still have that urge to hurry? The game looks like fun. I wonder if I can hear what they're saying. Elias cocked his ears. After a moment, his smile faded. Their laughter was strange. Rather than the high, bright sound of happy children, it came to him as the calling of crows, arguing over a decomposing rabbit. He shrank back further behind his cover. The sense of dread returned in force. Elias fumbled for his binoculars. First, he found the herd in the trees. <gasps> the animals were just over four feet tall at the shoulder. They had broad, barrel-shaped torsos. Their heads were wide, with protruding lips and large, square teeth. A coarse black mane ran from small, round ears down long necks. Their coats were of short, tan fur, striped reddish-brown, their tails black paintbrushes. Their short, sturdy legs ended in a central hoof-like toe, flanked by two smaller ones. Elias put the binoculars down. He shook his head in wonder and thought, These creatures shouldn't exist. They've been extinct for over five million years. Three-toed horses? More like the ancestors of horses. Merrick Hippus, one of the dawn horses, here, alive. Well, that means the petroglyph wasn't stylized at all, but really very accurate. And if the horses were accurate, then... A numbing chill grew in him. With shaking hands, Elias raised the binoculars to his face, having to steady them by digging his elbows into the sand. His lenses found the white ball where it had rolled to the edge of the cliff. It was a human skull, minus the jawbone. One of the players, not a child at all, came to collect it, bending its short torso to pick up the grisly plaything with long, sinewy arms and slender fingers ending in sharp black nails. Black, stringy hair fell across its face from the elongated head. With the skull in its grasp, it slowly rose to peer across the canyon in Elias's direction. No! I can't be seeing this! The face! The face! It wasn't human but may have shared a forgotten primate ancestor with humans. Its visage was terrible, apish, and cruel. A wide mouth full of jagged yellow teeth behind thin lips, cracked open in a grin of gleeful malice. Beneath the long, sloping forehead, round onyx eyes shone wetly with cunning. A bat's wrinkled nose sniffed the air. Its nostrils were flaring slits. Oh. Oh. The thing had not returned to the game, but stepped closer to the canyon's edge. No! It can't see me! It can't! The diminutive horror cocked its misshapen head, and Elias felt those awful eyes boring into his across the distance. It laughed, then a vulture's ugly squawk. <laughs> The binoculars fell from nerveless fingers to dangle loosely from his neck as Elias scuttled backwards. 
The modern part of his brain that studied the unknown with rationality was overridden by the ancient lobe, which understood when its body had been spotted by a dangerous hunter and had become prey. He crawled on his belly across the sand, away from the canyon's edge. He stole one last glance behind him. The awful beings were astride their dwarfish mounts, three-pronged spears in hand. They began riding as one. His pursuers were still separated from him by their canyon, but they probably possessed trails that could reach him. It would take time to make their way down and up, but they were mounted. They would catch him. Oh no! Oh no! What am I doing? I'm not a coward. I've never been hunted by creatures from a lost epoch before, but I'm still alive. I've got to think. That's the greatest and most underused power humans possess. I need a plan. The best one now is to run. Elias dodged between the great stones that were scattered across the divide. Sooty clouds crawled up from the strange horizon, tangerine heat lightning forking and flashing within. It's, it's only an hour until sunset. How did it get so late? He put as much speed as he could across the flats, his boots kicking up plumes of ochre dust. A painful stitch throbbed in his side, and his breath came in burning gasps. The advantage of the gulf between them would end soon. They would follow him on their awful little horses. He risked looking back, Elias thought. Nothing. Nothing. There. It's a dust cloud coming up from the canyon I just left. Figures appeared above the canyon's lip, one by one. The bizarre mounts now found their footing on the flat. They had made the crossing, and he had only put a mile between them. Elias forced his aching, dread-sick body forward by sheer will. He found the spot where he had climbed up. It was moderately dangerous if he took his time. A terrified scramble could end in disaster. A quick death by falling might be better than what the hunters had in store for him. A plan came to him. As quickly as he could make his hands move, he drew his climbing gear from the rucksack. He tied his rope around a solid-looking volcanic outcropping. Fighting to keep his shaking fingers under control, Elias donned the climbing harness and gloves. Elias shrugged his rucksack back on, then belayed down the sheer cliff as fast as he could without losing control. Eight wicked faces peered over the edge. I guess you hadn't figured on this. Ow! My arm! A rock had struck Elias's right bicep with aching force, but no severe damage. He tried to arc off the cliff face in unexpected directions to avoid the missiles. Elias thought, They must have run out of rocks with an easy reach. Thank God they don't have arrows. Snarling faces disappeared from view. They must have remounted. Do I have minutes or hours? The race was on again. Elias looked between his dangling boots. A forty-foot drop remained. He noticed then his rope ended twenty feet higher than the bottom. His palms burned despite the gloves. He managed to stop hurtling past the end of the rope. Elias now hung twenty feet above the canyon floor. Tears of frustration threatened to blur his vision. I'm too far away from anything I can climb by hand. There's no chance of a grip on that sheer wall. Why didn't they climb down the rope after me and try to cut it? I guess it hasn't occurred to them. <laughs> I might just survive this yet. Okay, what are my chances? Say, there's that steep dune I climbed on my way up to the cliff base. Well, why not? With a last carefully timed push, he swung out and released the rope. He held himself straight as he fell twenty feet through thin air. He came to a stop just six feet above sharp rocks. Hey! My crazy plan worked! I'm not gonna die! Not yet, anyway. Fortress rocks rose on his left as he ran, but offered no protection, he thought. If I had a ranged weapon, I could just stand here and pick them off. What a fool I am for not owning a rifle or even a pistol. All I can do is make it to the truck another mile away. I've just got to breathe and run and not fall on these sharp rocks. As Elias ran, Buck's words returned. 
If you start playing explorer in those back canyons, you're asking for trouble. Stay on the map, man. Now I know. I didn't heed the warning, and I did not listen to my instincts when they cried danger. What about the chisel in my belt? Those creatures have the advantage with their spears. He was now in the narrow opening of the canyon. The adrenaline surge which had carried him was fading. The passage opened out into the main valley. His truck stood a scant thirty feet away. Flaking green paint gleamed like a promise of paradise. He reached the pickup, numb fingers groped for keys. He bumped hard against the old Chevy's steel door. His hand found the handle, slid off, slick with sweat, and found it again. He started to climb in. Elias turned to see a rider's face through the window, wicked features twisted in what must be surprise. The weapon had glanced off tempered glass instead of skewering Elias's head. The rider's mount reared up and sent three-toed hooves crashing against the window. A crack appeared where the blow landed. The force slammed the door painfully on Elias's shins, oh! which still dangled out of the cab. The trembling key somehow found its way into the ignition as another trident bounced off the windshield. The riders circled the truck. Just then, the still unlocked passenger side door swung open. Apparently, they could learn. A sadistically grinning face appeared above the seat. Elias stepped on the gas, making two riders leap from the truck's path. His stowaway almost lost its grip, but then one long-fingered hand found the passenger side seat belt. Elias yanked the chisel from his belt and drove it into the rider's left eye, all the way to the handle. Purplish blood trailed across the vinyl as the dead goblin thing slid out the door. Elias realized he headed directly for a rock that could rip out the truck's undercarriage. He corrected sharply to the left, which caused the passenger side door to slam shut. Another rider appeared in his side window, bashing its trident repeatedly against the glass. Elias swung the wheel hard against the thing's mount, sending both crashing to the ground. The left rear tire bounced over something solid. Riders waved their tridents in frustration as they cantered alongside the truck. Elias noticed the rider he knocked down wasn't moving, crushed by the truck's rear wheel. Two down, six to go. Let's see how fast you little monsters can ride. A rider had jumped its Merikippus over the side into the flatbed. A trident shot through the cracked open back window to strike the rearview mirror. I get it, you little devil. You must think it was my face instead of a reflection. The beast and rider slid backward, but the closed tailgate stopped them from falling out. The trident remained lodged in the mirror's stanchion. The prongs were of a yellowish metal, probably bronze. Their sharp edges had cruel barbs. The other riders were forming a few yards off, apparently preparing another charge. The rider in the flatbed regained control of its mount. Elias slammed on the brakes. The three-toed horse fell against the back of the cab. The rider pitched over the roof, bouncing across the hood to land in a rolling jumble on the ground. The small horse jumped off into the sagebrush. The rider tried to regain its feet. As he sped away, Elias turned back to see the thing face down in the sand. Its companions blithely galloped over the broken body. Three down, five to go. Now return to Riders of the Three-Toed Horse. The surviving riders remained visible in his side mirrors, five dim shapes in the pall of dust. Elias accelerated to thirty, probably too fast for the rugged terrain. 
It was nearly evening, and he passed between the patches of bright light and deep violet shadow, which made it hard to see his way. He couldn't see the riders, but he knew they were there. He could feel a spike of terror deep between his shoulder blades. He glanced at the gas gauge, and the spike shot to his brain. The needle hovered just above empty. How could I be so stupid? Yesterday I put 200 miles on the truck and didn't think to fuel up. Okay, stop panicking. I'd estimate the cabin is another two miles away, and the river station is four miles beyond that. He stared at the gauge. The needle dipped closer still toward the big red E. He mulled over his choices. If I try to make the river station, there's a high chance of running out of gas before I arrive. If I try to go on foot, they'll catch me beyond a doubt. If I hole up in the truck, they'll find a way in. The horses have already cracked the glass. That leaves the cabin. The best thing I can do is lock all the doors, call Buck on the radio, and hope I can fend them off. There's the cabin! Weak with fear, Elias lurched in, his legs stiff and sore from abuse. Mayday! Mayday! Canyon Cabin River Station! This is an emergency! I'm under attack! Mayday! Mayday! Canyon Cabin to River Station! This is an emergency! I'm under attack! River Station here. What are you talking about, dude? Buck! This is Elias. I'm under attack. No, no, you're talking to Pete, buddy. I I'm Buck's assistant. Now, under attack from what? They're here! They're here! Tell Buck! Bring guns! They're trying the knob. Now it sounds like they're having their little horses kick at the door. Little horses? Now, now who are they? Could you be a little more specific? Just get over here! I hope he'll take that hint. What happened to the thumps? A hefty rock lay in the center of the room, surrounded by shards of plate glass. They were breaking through the picture window. I'll get out the back door! They're all in the cabin. I've got to head down the road. I hope there's enough gas left to meet Buck and Pete on the road. It's a long shot, but I can't win a fight against five at once. There they are again. Elias jammed the engine into reverse, backing away rapidly. Suddenly, the riders stopped their charge. They and their mounts froze as if turned to stone, staring at something down the drive. A band of chimeras with huge, grotesque heads were coming up the road behind him. Elias' terror turned to joy when he recognized the masked elders. There were three or four of them, it was hard to tell. They blurred and shifted in the early evening shadows. These were the men who had joined the ceremony late. None wore shoes or modern clothing, just the masks and short leather skirts. Elders! You're in danger! I told Pete and- One elder confidently raised a gray palm outward. The elders advanced slowly, passing the truck. The riders froze in place. Despite the monster's hardly inhuman features, Elias recognized an emotion he hadn't seen through his afternoon of pursuit. The riders were afraid. The elders now stood a few feet from the motionless lead rider. The lead elder lowered his palm toward the earth with a swift motion. A bolt of purple lightning arced up from the sandy ground into the rider's gaping mouth. The thing's head crackled with blue flames, while its mount shuddered beneath it. The small horse's eyes rolled back to show only whites. Its mane caught fire. The pair fell over in a smoking dead heap. The remaining four riders tipped their heads back in unison in a hideous chorus of rage. The elders paused and began their advance again, walking calmly toward their foes. The riders charged. One rider connected his trident squarely into an elder's chest, 
but it passed through as if brushing a cloud. The assaulted elder clasped the rider by the scrawny neck. The elder tossed the rider to the ground, saucer eyes dimming in death. Meanwhile, another rider appeared to be on fire, except the flames were deep red and gave off what could only be described as darkness instead of smoke. The mount bucked and hurled itself off the edge of the bank. Only two riders remained. They had somehow evaded the wrath of the elders and galloped down the road back to the valley. One fell limply from his speeding maritipus. A rusty brown truck roared up the drive. Buck stood in the flatbed with his rifle braced over the cab's roof. The last rider veered right and hurtled off the road, followed by the mountless animal. Elias found the strength to get out of his truck and limp to the ledge to join the elders. The surviving rider and the pair of three-toed horses fled back to the canyons. The elders nodded, satisfied. They silently turned to the charred remains of their kills. The elders produced leather bags and began cleaning up the carcasses. Buck jumped down and slung his rifle. A slim, weathered, blonde man in his late twenties got out from behind the wheel. <laughs> wow, dude. I wouldn't believe it if I wasn't seeing it. You weren't kidding. Little riders, I, I never thought I'd see one. Like you'd never seen anything weird yourself out here. Hey, Elias, are you all right? Yeah, I guess. It feels like I've had a bad nightmare. I'm awake, but it's still going on. You're awake. And damn lucky. The lead elder raised his palm, making Elias flinch. The elder's face was hidden behind the construction of wood and gleaming stones. The mask resembled a giant angry horned toad. The elder approached Elias. I want to thank you elders for helping me. I'm... I'm sorry for all the trouble. I hope you'll forgive me. The elder put his other hand out, gesturing for Elias to take its contents. Elias looked down to see the bottom half of a Merikippus leg, broken off from below the knee. A twine handle had been wrapped around the fur, near the joint, and blue agate beads were entwined between the three flinty black toes. Thank you. The elders walked silently back down the drive to the valley floor carrying their macabre collection of corpses. They faded into the deep shadows of the evening. Elias looked over at Pete and Buck and gave them a grim smile. Let's have some beers. Later, they sat drinking beer on the patio in the twilight. Buck gazed at the Marikippus leg. Did you kill any of the riders yourself? Yes, three of them. No one in our stories has ever killed so many of this enemy in one day. Your rescuers, those who walk in the sand without shoes, favor you greatly now. That's good. Because they must have been hopping mad when you stirred up that big mess on day one. Lucky they didn't carry you off in their bags. Elias, you earned a totem of great power. If you ever meet the Motakase, those riders that you saw today, just show them that leg bone. They'll clear off fast. Considering I didn't believe in magic at all this morning, I'm glad to have it now. Those elders who helped me, you didn't call them, did you? Nope. Nobody does. They show up when it suits them. Are they... are they human? Maybe they are. Or were, at one time. Nobody knows for sure. Those who walk in the sand without shoes have been with our people for thousands of years. Is anything else known about them? Who can say? That's all I can tell you. They, they don't much like being discussed. Thanks. Another thing. Today I was off the map, which I am really, really sorry about. I saw something else weird. It looked like the canyons just went on forever. It was like the Cascade Mountains weren't there. You caught a glimpse of the real shape of things. Maps are children's drawings, and satellite photos just distorted shadows. Our eyes see only a corner of a much larger canvas. Here in Agate County, we can glimpse the truth. 
that time and space as we know them are illusions. The rest of the world would rather pretend places like this don't exist, which is just fine with us. Anyway, I'm sure you've had enough of this craziness. Let's pack you up and get you out of the county. We'll arrange for a hotel room and vantage where you can rest up before heading back over the pass. You'll think it was really just a bad dream in a few weeks anyway. I'm not leaving. I have a job and I'm going to do it. Uh, you know, nobody's going to call you yellow if you get out of here. Not after what you did today. That was a major bad mojo you clobbered out there, those damn little riders. Well, that's good to hear. But you need to understand that I'm a scientist. Despite the ordeal, this has been the most incredible day of my life. I can't wait to see more. You couldn't drag me away from Agate County with wild horses, even if they have three toes. You have been listening to Riders of the Three-Toed Horse, a radio play by Garrett Vance and Burke Duncan. Based on the novelette by Garrett Vance, published in Jim Bain's Universe, February 2009, available online at www.bains-universe.com. Burke Duncan played Elias Ulstrom. Bob McAllister played Buck Lopez. Kevin Veach played Pete. Frank Jacobson played the leader of the elders. I am your narrator, Michael Leonard. Music by Ben Endicott and Corey Cook of Soundscape Industries. Sound effects by Ben Endicott, Corey Cook, and Kevin Veach. Creative consultation by Jason Mark Harris, Ph.D. Produced by Burke Duncan. Directed by Kevin Veach. Riders of the Three-Toed Horse, a radio play, is published as an audiobook by Northwest Folklore, copyright 2009, and is available on Amazon.com.